Hello, this is the fourth video on conservation principles and systems. The essential question is, how can I use open and closed systems to track the flow of conserved variables over time? Uh, this is a video I'm particularly passionate about. Um, I think that the idea of conservation is the single most important big idea in all of physics. Uh, and frankly, professional physicists and people that um, scientists that publish data for our country and for our world, um, they always come back to these big ideas because these are like unviolatable principles of the universe. So hopefully um, you guys will see how in the ideas of conservation, we can get some tools that really um, are powerful as we move through the world of physics. So what are the principles of conservation? What does it mean to conserve something? The word conservation is defined as to keep keeping the same amount of something over a period of time. You may have heard it in like, uh, environmental applications, um, conserve water, right? We want to keep the water in the world relatively conserved. We want to keep the same amount and not waste is, is the big idea. But in physics, we talk about conservation for a variety of variables. Uh, interestingly, um, as far as physicists can tell, there's actually six things that are conserved in the universe. That's actually a pretty small number when you consider all of the variables in the universe. These are not the same as the six fundamental constants. These are six different things uh, that cannot be created or destroyed. When the universe started, when the Big Bang happened, we had a certain amount of these things, and we still have the same amount now, uh, and that's pretty amazing. Those six things are mass, momentum, which if you can't define momentum, that's fine. We'll come back to that later in the year. Something called angular momentum, which is even a little bit more complex than momentum, but we'll, um, we won't cover that this year. Uh, but if you take AP Physics C, we'll talk about that a lot. Uh, energy, which is what we're covering in this unit as well. Charge, which will come up in our um, electricity unit, and then spin. So those are the six conserved properties. You'll see some overlap with the fundamental variables and some differences. Uh, and any case, the principles of conservation as they apply to mass, momentum, energy, and charge are going to be kind of our, our underlying focus for the entire year. So when I start considering um, how to solve a problem in physics, one of the first steps I usually take um, as kind of a professional physicist is to draw a system. Um, drawing a system is like an imaginary line or box around an object and separating that object from the rest of the world because things are messy, the world's complicated. And if I can isolate just the little pieces that I'm interested in, solving problems in physics becomes a lot easier. So let's say we're gonna have a physics problem with this block of wood. There's plenty of physics problems with blocks of wood, sliding blocks of wood, being yanked blocks of wood, dropped blocks of wood. Um, if I wanted to make this block of wood into a system, what I would do is just in my brain or on my paper, draw a box around that and then say the wood is the system. There are gonna be two kinds of systems. We'll talk about those in more detail in future slides. But um, if I want this wood to be inside what's called a closed system, we're gonna draw a solid box around it. I'll define that in a minute. Um, or if I wanted uh, a different kind of system called an open system, I would draw a dashed box. So if I had uh, a car, for example, um, I still want to just consider the car, but I might be interested in an open system with that car, and we'll talk about why in a few minutes. But when you see these boxes around things, you'll know that I've created a system. A closed system assumes the object is completely isolated from the rest of the universe. That means we're not going to let anything go in and nothing go out. It's pretty much impossible to create a closed system in the universe, even if you you know, take a box and you duct tape it shut. There might be air or light or other things that are going through. So closed systems aren't really um, functionally, you can't make a true closed system, but you can get pretty close if you try um, to really, really separate things from their environment. The thing about closed systems that makes them nice in physics is that we know that all of those variables we talked about a few slides ago that are conserved, there's going to be the same amount of those things in my system whether I look right now, five years, 10 years, a thousand years from now, we should still have the same amount of mass, energy, momentum, angular momentum, um, charge and spin in those systems that we started with as there is at any time. Um, and we would denote that with that sigma, right? If I add up all the mass or the whatever in the system, the sigma mass is gonna be the same today and tomorrow. So for example, if I had a closed system with that block of wood and a handful of nails, um, two days ago, today, 
with some effort, maybe I've turned that into a birdhouse. I have to keep the exact same amount of wood in there and, and those nails, I can change their orientation. I can move stuff around inside my system, but I'm still gonna conserve the mass of the wood. I'm still gonna keep all the things inside the system. An open system, on the other hand, allows variables, mass, energy, momentum, etc., to move in and out of the system. Um, so some systems, it doesn't really make sense to try to keep them closed. A car, for example, things are constantly moving in and out of cars. And so physics has to be able to accommodate the fact that the car is not staying the same all the time. Um, so in an open system, we would be using this delta operator regularly to talk about how the, how the individual variables are changing and the amount of each variable is changing over time. Sometimes we're going to have positive delta, so positive delta mass or positive delta energy. Um, when people go in a car, that's a positive delta mass. We are adding mass to the car. When you put gasoline in that car, it's actually adding mass and adding energy because the energy of gasoline is why the car can drive. So those examples are open systems, and you'll see that I put these things, they started outside the system, and they've got arrows that are going in. Um, so when we have this open system with the dashed lines around it, we let things go in or out. You can also have negative delta um, of our conserved variables for a open system. So um, negative delta mass, heat, well, that's actually energy, but heat could come out of the system. That would be a negative delta energy. Uh, tailpipe gases have mass and they would come out of the system. So that's a negative. Rubber, when you squeal your tires on the road, you could lose rubber from your car. Um, so all of those things are taking mass and energy and, and, and those conserved variables out of the system. Okay, so we're going to work with these um, ideas more and specifically with conservation of mass and energy in future slideshows, but I wanted to introduce just the big idea in this slideshow, which is how can I use open and closed systems? What does it mean to be an open or a closed system? And um, how do we use these to track the flow of conserved variables or the change in conserved variables over time? So go ahead and take a few minutes, if you would, please, and write this in your own words, summarize the statement, um, and then come back to the comic when you're done. Classic Calvin.